maybe I'll tell you a little bit about my background before we get started. Oh, well, first thing, first requirement. If anything I say today sounds goofy to you, all you got to say is, Tom, that's stupid. Okay, got that? Mm -hmm. so, on, so on three, I want you to practice that. I want you to say out loud, Tom, that's stupid. One, two, three. Tom, Tom that's, that's stupid. stupid. Not a problem. Been married 54 years. Get that almost every day from my supervisor. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to try and step through, uh, step through some things. Let me give you a little bit about my own background. Uh, well, would you like to know about my background, how I got to Jesus? Absolutely. Now, it's a day only, when we ask you questions, watch them. This will be yes, and this will be no. Okay. So I'm going to tell you about my background. So my grandparents were from England, and uh, I was raised in Eugene, Oregon. And my grandmother from England would come down to visit me in Eugene, Oregon. She lived in Portland, Oregon. And Portland, Oregon to Eugene is about 120 miles. And in those days, she would take the train, and she would come down to Eugene. And I want you to talk about yourself. Here's what I want you to add. Ask yourselves and answer this question. Who's been the biggest influences in your life? You know, parents, siblings, teachers, coaches. You know, we mentor somebody, and you're going to be mentoring somebody. You know, uh, well, let me ask you this question first before you do that. Let's say you're mentoring people. I believe this, I believe this, this is my feeling, that when those people, when their life is about to end, and they were asked, who are some of the top five mentors you had in your life? I think everybody in this room would want to be on that list or something, right? If someone said, who are the top mentors that influenced your life? I think everybody in this room would want to be on somebody's list, because then you've really added value on the planet for another person, okay? Are you with me? So, so, so what, that's going to be our, our backdrop for today, is how do we get into that space. So for right now, I want you to write down or just talk about yourselves three or four minutes. Who has been the biggest influences in your life? Teachers, coaches, parents, siblings, brothers. Who are those people? Talk amongst yourself. Who have those people been? Okay, please start that. Jesus. 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 Jesus.
Now priests are, but let's step back from priests. Who in this room would like Jesus to be more of an influence in your life? Yeah, I'm all in on that, right? If my arm's not raised. We've got another program down to speak for you. So this is, this is really important. To be an effective mentor, you got to have Jesus at the center of your life. you got to have Jesus at the center of your life. To be an effective mentor. All of you do. But it's interesting, every time I've done this, no one ever says the biggest influence has been Jesus. It is. I know parents and all that. But typically parents, the reason they're mentoring you is they've been influenced by Jesus in some way. Okay. Right? So the biggest influence I think I want in my life is Jesus Christ. And I want it to be deeper. I want it to go from my head into my heart. Now look up here at this model for a minute. This is what we call the, this is called the iceberg model. And what the iceberg model says is this. The iceberg model says that 10% of an iceberg is above the water. That's what you see. The 90% of an iceberg is below. So if the 90% isn't there, what happens to the iceberg? It sinks, right? So Tom Welch gave us 10 commandments of mentoring, right? So I want you to think about, whoops, wrong button, my fault. Tom Welsh gave us the 10, the 10 commandments of mentoring. They sit up here. Those are things we do. Those are things we do. And they're all important, right? But today we're going to focus on what needs to be down here so that those 10 commandments really happen. Now, you can mentor somebody, and you can open up your sheet, and you can say, here's the ten things, and you start reading them. And that might be mentoring, right? But what really is mentoring is, how does that come across? What's the style in which I'm doing this? How are my true feelings coming through? Okay. Remember, the commandments, not, 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 I don't want you to leave and forget this. They're, that's this stuff, and it's good stuff. But what, what, what's down here is what we're going to talk about. Okay? Now, what do you think would be some of the things that a person should have to be an effective mentor? What are some of the feelings, virtues inside of a person's heart they should have to be an effective mentor? Listen. Pardon? Listen. They've got to have listening skills. That's excellent. That's so the thing. What else? Honesty. Pardon? Honesty. Honesty. Keep going. Patience. Patience. What else? Love. Pardon? Love. Love. What else? You have to be grounded. You have to be grounded. All, all those are correct, right? There's one more we haven't said. We're kind of hovering around the bulls. But what's a core belief someone has to have to be an effective mentor? So you've got to care about another person. Right. Right. To care deeply. Now, if you care about another person, you will listen better. Yes. You will love that person. Okay. And so, so we're going to talk, we're going to spend today, my time with you, is going to be largely spent in this space. Now, you can find out on the website, and Tom's, Tom wonderfully listed for you, you can find out what, what those tasks look like. It's kind of like in Cecil's world, the financial stuff, right? You can prepare... Uh, a lot of financial statements, but down here, what Cecil tries to do, and he's pretty good at it, I have to care that non-financial people understand this stuff. He's got to care that non-financial people understand what's the business message in the financial statements. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Are you getting this distinction between tasks and how you go about doing your tasks? Are you getting this? This will be yes, this will be no, and the questions will be easier, I promise, okay? That's where we're going to spend our time. We're going to spend our time down in that 90% section, trying to get after that. And uh, if at any time you have questions, you know, I want you to please stop me. I'd like us together to say this opening prayer. Together. Together, let's pray. Father, we come to you at this time asking for your blessing and help. We are gathered together. We pray for your guidance in matters at hand and ask that you show us how to live our lives in Jesus' will. Give us the desire to carry out the tenets of the Brotherhood of St. Andrew so that we can create an environment for others to know and engage in Jesus Christ. Now, if I was king for a day, and I never am, you just need, you just need to tell my wife at home, the queen of all, thee who must be obeyed. But if I was King Cordeo, I would have you never forget this last part. What we are about as a group is creating an environment for others to know and engage with Jesus Christ. That's what we are called to do. Now watch this now. To bring men and youth to Christ. 
we got to create an environment so they want to come to Jesus Christ. You see that distinction? Mm -hmm. To get men and youth to come, we have to create that environment if they want to come to Jesus. So let's talk in that space for just a minute more. How many of you feel that you can motivate another person? Okay. Let's put that under spyglass for a moment. I think you can short term. You can motivate another person short term through money or fear. Tom, if you do that again, you're going to get fired. Okay, I'll never do that again. I promise. I promise. Tom, if you do that again, you get more money. Okay, I'll do that. But once the money or the fear is gone, the behavior doesn't necessarily change. And if you'll notice, Jesus never used those two things. But he created an environment which people were motivated. You understand? Took those disciples along with him, showed them by example, let them experience through parables and other ways. Here's how you create that environment for other people, right? So, this creating an environment for others, it's not like, a, this is, God, please forgive me when I say that. Okay. It's not like a Southern Baptist preacher says, if you don't know, come down to this altar call right now, you're going straight to hell. Well, that won't do it for me. <laughs> That's not the loving Jesus that I believe in knowing, right? So our job as a mentor is to create that environment through the listening, the love, the caring, that let people know that we've got something that they might want. We've got something that they might want. That's not to tell them what it is, right? So that's what we're going to spend our time about. And never forget this for me. Our job as a brother of St. Andrew to bring men and youth to Christ, the way you do that is you create an environment for others to know the need of Jesus. And that environment comes from practicing this below, but these are called virtues down here. These are tasks, virtues. Tasks, virtues. Virtue means I care about you. I care about you so much, and I want to try to help you get in the space where God is, right? So, we call, we call living in this space a closer walk. We call living in this space is a closer walk. Now, a closer walk, what do those words mean? Well, if you've ever played uh, horseshoes or hand grenades, it's got a different meaning. And those are called fat words, closer walk. Okay, now, sometimes we think about, here's Jesus and here's me. You know, that's, we kinda, I think that's one of the big, have you ever heard this song? Just a closer walk with thee, precious Jesus, hear my plea. Right? Or learn that song, right? So let's put closer walk under spy lines. And here's what it means to me. This is what it means to me. And we're going to talk about this more. But a closer walk means this. Every belief I have, thought I have, word I say and thing I do, will be what Jesus believes, thinks, such and does. That's my personal mission statement, by the way. Every belief Tom Martin has, every thought Tom Martin has, every word Tom Martin says, and everything Tom Martin does is just what Jesus would do. I'm never going to get there, and I understand that. But that's my North Star. That's my closer walk. See, my closer walk, I feel I've got to get that from my head into my heart so deep that it comes back out through normal conversation with other people. How I live my life. You don't need to ask me. Pardon? Belief, thought, belief. We're going to talk about what you believe right. leads to what you think, leads to what you say and what you do. There's nothing that doesn't fit that continuum. There's nothing on the planet that does not fit in that continuum. So my personal, every day of my life, I want to work on my belief system with Jesus so my thinking gets better and so that my words and actions are more in tune with what Jesus would think, say, or do. That's what we need. That's what we mean by close to walk. That's to do with a North Star. A North Star. That's something that that's, that, that's something that, that that I believe that I want to get to. You know, that, that my life is geared to that. And we all have North Stars in our life, right? I'll give you an example for me. Okay. So I've got probably as, as you do as we age, issues, health issues. And I've had some heart disease about five years ago at surface, and I weighed uh, way too much now, I weighed more. And so the uh, cardiologist said, Tom, here's what can happen. You're like an old air-cooled 
Volkswagen Beetle trying to pull a 40 foot wooden Chris Craft inboard boat. Something's going to break. It's not the boat. So my North Star is to be healthy, to live with my grandsons, and say, grow up with my wife. I've been blessed and married up. I couldn't make it through life without my wife. But to, to be there forever. And so that's a North Star. So that's caused me to think differently and to do different things, right? So this North Star, if we get our North Star anchored in Jesus Christ, anchored in Jesus Christ, as deep as we can, the tendency is that we will continue to grow and that last point should have keep. We can live our life without intervention. How many of you in this room, and this is the first, first question of a take for me today, and God is watching all your answers. And I'm How many of you have ever said or done something you were sorry for later? I'm all in. I got on Cecil's not raising his hand. No, he is writing. So listen to me now. It's important. When you get into that space and you've said or done something and you think about it, that wasn't me. That wasn't Jesus. Two things are important. If you can forgive, ask for forgiveness. But it's really important. It's a learning opportunity for us. Why did I get to that space? What made me so angry that I did that? Why did I do that? Then you start asking that question. But that's the space then for Jesus to come into your life. Let me give you an example. When I, uh, well, I retired four years ago, I worked 50 years for Georgia Pacific. Out of the first 25, I was in Cecil's world, and I was CPA, and I was a vice president of finance and a division controller. I did a lot of county work the first 25 years. And I never felt like I was helping another person. I would hand off these wonderful financial statements to someone like Dave, and Dave would go, hmm. And that was about the only impact I felt I was making on the planet. <laughs> now you got to have those, like Cecil prepared. you got to have that stuff, because you got to know how your business is right. But I never felt like I was helping another person. So I considered Episcopal Seminary very gently twice. But we had two young boys, and I felt that would be too drastic of a lifestyle wouldn't be fair. And so I went back to school at night. I still want to help people. still want to help people. And I got a master's degree with a focus on industrial psychology. Then I went back to Georgia Pacific and I asked them, they, they have five businesses, if I could be in charge of all the adult learning of that one business. So for the last 25 years before I retired, 50% of my business was doing all the financial analytics around expansions and, and, and capital spending. Then all the adult learning for that business. Now I had, I had a team, they did a lot of the technical training about how to operate the equipment. And I worked on leadership and culture values. And that's what I've been doing with this brother. I've been the brother for 40 years. Probably the last 10 or 12 I've been doing what we're doing right now, that stuff. And so I feel very strongly, very strongly that we all want to live our lives without intervention. We all want to live our lives so we don't have to come back. So, working at Georgia Pacific, I lived in Marietta, Georgia, which is 22 miles from the headquarters of the building. Every morning I wake up, and the feeder road to get to the interstate has three lanes each way. So you got a lot of traffic in the morning. Once you get on the interstate, you go down and you got eight lanes each way. So if you like traffic, you just need to get in that. If you don't like traffic, get out. And so, so early on when I was doing that, I used to get very frustrated and angry. If someone would cut in front of me without doing a signal or not leaving a space. So I almost gave them the, the Interstate 75 salute, which is this with one finger extended northward. Right? But I never did. And Ten years ago, I started thinking. I started thinking this way. I started thinking this way. Maybe that person that has just done that. Maybe they have a crisis and they have to get somewhere to help solve that crisis. I never knew if that was true, but that's how I thought about it. Okay. And, and I, I wouldn't say I was proud of myself for thinking like that, but I thought, you know, that's probably an okay way to think. So, so at that moment, I could live my life without intervention. I didn't have, have my wife tell me, Tom, don't do that. You know, I had no. so, 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 so that's how you can measure some of that stuff. I think all of us want to live our life without intervention. You know, as we grow. Well, the model we've been talking about, this model comes from Gandhi. It's been around forever. Okay. And it says simply, what we believe leads to what we think. I don't think that's going to show on the screen. So what we believe leads to what we think leads to what we, we say and do. And then we get results. There's nothing on the planet that does not fit this model. Everything fits this if we get a bad answer, bad, we did something bad, we got to go back, what was I thinking, what did I believe? And if we get a good answer, it's important to go back and think, what was I thinking? Do you want to share that with other people, right? 
So that, that's the basic, that's a basic life model that's been there forever, and, and it always will be. And some of the impacts of that model, when our beliefs are deep with Jesus, but this left-hand side of that chart is deep with Jesus Christ, as deep as you can get it, then your thinking's going to be better, and your words and actions are going to be aligned. So how long did Jesus take with the disciples to get their beliefs correct? Three years, Three right? years. Three, and they still were working on it. Yeah, so it's not perfect. It's not a light switch. But they, pardon me. Yeah. But they kept working on it. So the trick is to keep working on it. Beliefs. Never give up. The minute you think you've got all the Jesus belief system you need, you don't. I'm first to tell you, you don't. I think it's always there for us to learn. Who, who, who thinks they know everything they need to know about Jesus Christ? Did you raise your hand or just scratch your nose? <laughs> I just see that you see that. So that ought to be our North Star, I believe. Is to how do I have Bible studies one way, talking to others another way, and, and sharing situations you've been in where you didn't see Jesus or you did. Okay? So we've already talked about the emotional reaction to something we're sorry for later. Who has been through the journey of raising teenage children? Yeah, welcome to the planet. Who has ever said something to a teenage child that you're sorry for later? Welcome to the planet. Now, well, watch right here. Watch right here. This is true for teenage children. It's also true for adults and relationships. Mentorship is built largely on relationships, right? So this next part of it. Remember anything out of today, I want you to remember this. You are master of the unspoken word. The spoken word is the master of the word. You get that? You are master of the unspoken word. The spoken word is the master of the word. If you don't watch that, that can destroy more relationships, especially those children. You know, that's the part. I made mistakes in that space. Too many. Too many. You know, I'm better now, but too many. I've got the pleasure of grandson, so I've got a second chance around this track, and I hope I'm doing better. But you are master of the unspoken word. The spoken word is the master of you. So Jesus wants our words and our deeds to be based on thoughts and belief systems about him. Now, let's say something bad happens. With, yes, go ahead, please, I, Rich. You repeat that one more time. What? You are master right. of the unspoken word. All right. The spoken word is the master of you. Once you come back, let's say you've had an interaction with somebody, right. maybe it's just a child, mm -hmm. your teenage son, and maybe they did something that you didn't want them to do, and, 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 and that day they did that, you said, you know, tell them you're dumber than a box of rocks, mm -hmm. right? But you can't come back the next day no, and say, right. you know, I really didn't mean that. Mm -hmm. you, that doesn't work, because they know you've lost control, one, and you, you've demeaned them, right? Mm -hmm. You've demeaned them. So, you, you, so th that's what this model mm -hmm. tries to say. The more we can now, the more we can deepen Jesus in our beliefs and our thoughts, less chances of that happening. It's still going to happen, right. but there's less chances. There's less chances of that happening. Okay? Mentoring is absolutely key. When you're mentoring somebody, you got to really be careful of how you're saying and what you're doing. And so we're going to talk about this later. But here's a quick question for you: When you're a one-on-one -on -one mentoring relationship with somebody, what percent of the time do you think you should talk versus the mentee, the other person? What percent of the time do you think you should talk versus the other person? Most of the choice. I would say. Huh? Well, Dave's getting close. It's about 20% B, 80%. Now, sometimes it's different. Yeah. Sometimes it might be 50 feet. But it's never you talking 80. Right. You have to create the environment to find out what are they thinking and, and why do they think the way they think. Okay. I had a wonderful experience uh, two weeks ago. I'm a Winston Churchill fan. How many are Winston Churchill fans? I love the guy. I'm on the board of directors for the Winston Churchill Society of Georgia, and I went to the uh, International Winston Churchill Society Conference in Edinburgh, Scotland. It's just marvelous. I've been to all these places, but, but one evening I couldn't sleep, so I went down in this club area at the hotel, and there was this lady working there. She's an atheist. And we started this conversation. And a wonderful conversation, you know. And she asked me a question that I want you not to respond today. But I want you to leave here asking yourself this question. If somebody you were mentoring said, why do you believe in Jesus? What would you say? Oh, my parents told me, the Bible said, well, I've got all that. But away from that, what is it about Jesus that you want him at the center of the life? What makes you show up on a Saturday? Well, the food and the commodity and all that. But really, way down deep. So, good question. 
So my, what do you think my question back to her was? Remember, she said, why do you believe in Jesus? And I think I got out some words that, I don't know if God was pleased with them, but I don't think he was displeased with what I said. What do you think her response was? What do you think, no, what do you think my question to her was? So you answered her question with a question. What do you believe in? What do you, I know you don't believe in God, that, because that's what atheists mean. Mm -hmm. Which must be, I think people believe in something. So what's your belief in? It was, it was shell shock. I've never thought about that too much. I just thought about what I don't believe in. You know, I don't know if that helped me or not. I said, well, I, it's just an observation. You know, I, I think if we guide our lives by, by not believing in things, we've got a void. We've got this void. Okay. So, so this, this idea of having G, Jesus deep in your soul is, is really key. Now, you understand the concept. Everyone understands the concept, right? This will be yes, this will be no. Everyone got it? So where do we see this in the presence of St. Anthony? So on the top, on the top, that's that box. And look at the next line. Our prayer, study, and service, that leads to an environment for others to know Jesus, right? So our prayer and study, that's much like working on your beliefs and thoughts. That's how we think our beliefs and our thoughts will get better, through our prayer and study. That's what we're trying to do. That's what we are trying to do, is to get our belief system deep through that, and then we go to our service. The order that's important, right? Prayer, study, then service. That's not saying you, you have to do that to do service. You can do service all the time. But if it's, if it's couched in the, if you've, you've prayed about it, studied about it before, you, it's a richer thing for the receivers. You're, you're not preaching to them, but you'll feel richer too. Right? That's why prayer, study, and service is just, you know, Brother Chris Andrew could have been, we're a service organization. We go out, we feed people, and we just march along. It's meant to be the best individual spiritual development tool on the planet. And if you work largely in that prayer, so it aligns well with Gandhi's model. Through our prayer and study, we deepen our beliefs. Service comes through a deep Christ-like lens, and the order is important. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about what the brotherhood is to kind of center us on that. But that prayer and study and service, and that beliefs thoughts, every Sunday in our liturgy, we say words that align with this. Now, we don't say those exact words, but think of our liturgy. Who can tell us, in our liturgy, we say something that's built on this concept? Where do we say it? The Greek? Pardon? The Greek? Get closer. We're hovering around the bulls like we're not right there. We say it every Sunday. Follow me and see if you can fill the blank. Please forgive me for my thoughts and words. Word and and deeds. Deeds. Please forgive me for my thoughts do you see how that's aligned with this? Can you see that? Please forgive me for my thoughts, words, and now what that says to Tom Martin, it says, if I can get Jesus to forgive me for my thoughts before they become words and deeds, I can trap my thinking, my negative thinking. If I can get that done, odds are my words and deeds are going to be done. Do we see that? Do you see that connection? That, I, the beauty of that book of common prayer. There's more stuff in that book of common prayer. It's awesome. So that's how that Gandhi model and how the Brotherhood model aligns with our liturgy. Please forgive me for my thoughts, words, and deeds. So if I get my thoughts around Jesus Christ, odds are my words and deeds are going to be better. Not perfect all the time. So we've got to keep working on the left hand side of that chart. Especially if we're going to be a business. I cannot think of more important role on the planet for us than the other one. I cannot think that's what we're called to do. And it's not called to say, David, I think you need to believe in Jesus Christ. It's, it's, it's not that. You know, it's finding out what they believe in and try to encourage them uh, to do better. So, that idea of beliefs is pretty key. So I want to talk next. So, are we okay so far? Any disagreement with what I'm saying? Are we okay? This will be yes, this will be So I want to talk then about how do I get my beliefs deeper. So if I believe this model, that if my beliefs are deep, I think it's going to be better. I work it. So, so if, that, if I really believe that model, okay, how do I get my belief system deeper? 
But one of the ways is prayer and study. But I'm going to show you a model that seems to work. So, so any time we want to deepen our beliefs, there's four distinct stages. We become aware of something, then we understand it, then we get committed to it, and then it becomes fully internalized. Those four distinct stages. Someone tell me about a hobby that you have. Golf. What? Golf. Okay, let's take golf. Let's take golf for Yes. Rick, you're pointing to somebody here. Oh, no, I'm just counting. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. So let's take golf. Let's take golf. I could become aware and I could understand golf by reading a book. So I could, I could read a book. I, I play and teach little golf. My bat's broken in three places. I can't swing this far, but I do play and teach. So, so I could read a book about playing golf. And I could understand about playing golf. But if I never got out in the fairway, I never hit a ball, it's not going to be internalized. It'll stay up here. Piano. I could read a book about where C sharp is versus B flat. I could do all of that, right? Fishing. Any, any hobby you have, you can leave it up in the top two. That's called knowledge. You've got head knowledge. But you don't have heart knowledge. And you won't have heart knowledge left until you get out there and you swing and you hit the ball or you play the piano. You're with me on this model, right? So let's take, let's take the Bible. Let's take the Bible. So I can get the first two pretty good. I can read scripture, and I can even quote scripture. I'm so good, I can quote scripture, right? If I don't get out there and live it, it's not going to go deep. It's not going to. I can always quote John 14, 7, 7, 8, 9, 9, 9. But listen, listen, it's real important. Now. If, if I was king for a day, you might, you might want to write this down. I, I, don't, I don't think it's that great, but I think it's pretty good. I'd much rather see Jesus than only hear about it. I'd much rather see Jesus than what people do than only hear about it. I hear about it every Sunday. You do too. But I want to see that. I want to see people being kind to other people. That's what I believe. And those are the people that have, have kind of internalized Jesus Christ deeply. Okay? And all of us has a chance to take this journey. That bottom two, commitment internalized, the top part is called knowledge. The bottom is called personal knowledge. I want a personal knowledge of Jesus Christ in my life. I, I don't want only scripture. I love scripture. I love reading it. I love Bible study. All of that. We have a, my, my brothers, we have a morning prayer on Monday, and we go to an inner city, uh, pack 8,000 meals in the inner city of Atlanta every Wednesday. Thursday morning is Bible study. And Friday morning, we all work in a homeless shelter the recovering house, uh, house for recovering addict, Catholic house, at, at 5 o'clock in the morning. Every one of those, before we go, we do some prayer and study. To say, this this deal today, let's anchor it in some prayer, right? So if you're doing Bible study in your chapters, which I think you are, it's good. Ask yourself this question at the end of every Bible study you do. How am I going to live that out today? What's that calling me to do today? Not, and I think it's good to have all the conversations and the memorization and Say, we have a guy in our group that's reading, and read, we're reading Peter 7, so he said, well, also it's in Matthew. Okay, that's all good. I got that. But what are we going to leave this room today thinking differently about what we just read? How are we going to do that? So you got that point, right? So where, there's another piece of liturgy. I'm talking about living out Scripture. There's another, another piece in our liturgy that we say every Sunday that talks about living out Scripture. What's that passage that you and I say every Sunday? We've said it ever since we've been in church. What, what, that's part of a prayer. What, what, what's that passage that's part of a prayer? Thy will be done. We say that every day, right? We don't say, help me read more and help me do more. We say, thy will for Tom be done. So we're actually saying, and we're calling ourselves to live this stuff out. You want to be, you want, I, I tell people, every, every day, that you want to work on Jesus, I want you to work on the left-hand side of that chart with the least your thoughts about Jesus, and I want you to work on the bottom half of that chart. How do I take stuff I've read and make it deeper, right? And here's some examples of how one might do that in church, right? So down the left-hand side is aware, understand, get committed to it, and then it becomes internalized. So a summary of some activities you can see to become aware, you might attend church and you might read the Bible. That's good. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? 
And then you're going to understand it more. You're going to participate in Bible study. And you can participate in small groups. So now you've got this knowledge, and you want to transfer it from head down into your heart. From knowledge to personal knowledge. So one thing you can do, and there's several of them. Oh, first, over on the right. That, that's called knowledge. And over on the example of knowledge, you can recite the Nicene Creed and the Lord's Prayer from memory. You can do that. Okay. That's an example of head knowledge, right? And down at the bottom, to take that deeper, you want to do some outreach, take on new roles at church, be in one-on-one -on -one conversations with others, and then to really get it internalized, continually practice, continual outreach, facilitate a Bible study or church class, and continual study. That becomes personal knowledge. And the example then, your individual's life is reflective of the deep understanding of the Nicene Creed, the Lord's Prayer, and the individual could probably, if they wanted to, facilitate classes on the meaning of those two critical documents. Okay. So for me, this is how I kind of measure myself. What am I doing every day to get Jesus further internalized? So that every thought I have, word I say, and thing I do, be what Jesus would think, say, or do. And I'm never going to get there, and I got there. But I want to be working on that with every breath I have, every breath I take. So think about your own life. You know, what are, what are we doing to... Uh, to uh, you know, make that happen. Are we really making that happen like Jesus wanted to happen? Well, let's look at this iceberg model like we did over there. Let's define a little bit then uh, how that might work. So before we go there, what, what is the top? What's the top ten percent? We said that is the tasks. The bottom one. That's the tasks we're doing. Just think about it simply. The bottom is how we do those tasks. The bottom is virtues that we have, that we care about people. That kind of stuff, right? So I think you can you can pick up a book and you can you can uh, you can learn how to do the top part. So for a brotherhood for person, tasks or service, um, evangelizing by I don't mean like street corner preaching, but I mean um, talking to people when appropriate about Jesus in your life, or living out Bible studies. That's the ten percent. Living out Bible studies, right? So let's look at the ninety percent. Here's some things, and these are called virtues and beliefs needed for a closer walk to occur. Now, let's not forget, closer walk means, closer walk means this, that I, Jesus has, has moved from my head into my heart. And if you're not done, that's not a one-time journey. That's a lifetime journey of desiring to move Jesus from your head down in your heart. That's a lifetime journey. Okay. So some of the things down there, you can work on relationships with others. Work on relationships. And like I think Dave King told us and a couple others, relationships, if I'm in a relationship with Dave, I'm talking usually 80%, he's talking to him. Mentoring is a relationship built on care, right? That's mentoring is. We'll talk a little bit later about how you might have that conversation with somebody younger than us. Okay, if we look at the average age in this room, uh, it's probably over 50. I didn't be over 50. We want to be talking to people in their 30s and 40s if they want to be talked with. Servant leadership. What's the definition of servant leadership? Who can define servant leadership for us? Da, 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 is that is okay for a short time. No comments, no lunch. <laughs> How would you define? We always hear this word servant leadership. How would you define it? Help you do things for it. Help you do things for people. The, 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 that's exactly right. You might want to write this down. The role of a leader is to serve those that follow. The role that's servant leadership is Nick's exactly right. Now, 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 watch this real quick. Watch this real quick. So, the role of a leader that's up here is to serve those that follow. That's what this is. The ninety percent is what Nick was talking about. I care about those people. I care about those people. That's why I'm going to serve. So, the to do of servant leadership is to care about people. Without blows, you can have a deep sense of caring about it. So that you want help. So you can't let something go by when you see it without help. Right? That's what servant leadership. So um, that's another thing down down in this box. Down below, the virtues. These are virtues we want a brother to have or a mentor to have. Very effective communications. Effective communication. Um, talk about that. Can I say I'm an effective communicator? Who, 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 who is the judge of whether Tom's an effective communicator? Everybody but Tom. <laughs> Can Tom say I'm an effective listener? 
I might think so, but who's the judge of Tom's listening? Everybody Tom's talking to. Yeah. Oh, and watch this one. Raise your hand if you think you're a humble person. <laughs> no one should raise their hand. <laughs> but Jesus wants us to be humble. So you've got to have humility as part of your soul. Deep. Now, that's hard to measure. You know, you don't come up to someone and say, well, Mr. Clark, uh, am I humble? No, you, you don't say it like that, right? But I do this. I do this. I've got three brothers that I want a lot of input on every time they see me. If you see Tom Martin not acting in a humble way, take me out behind the barn and help me. Help me get better. Because I was wrong, and I need your help. Okay. It's hard to measure whether you're a humble person. You might think you are, and that's a good thought to have. No question that's a good thought. Remember, humility is measured by the other person. Listening is measured by the other person. And communication is measured by the other person. Now, communication also has a measure if you get to the result that you both want. That would be pretty effective, right? So effective communication is key. I think down below, one of the other things that's really important is if you think of others first. You don't live life as, after me, you come first. After me, you come first. You can be first right after me. So people, you live life that you think about the first. That doesn't mean you're going to do something different, maybe, but you think that way. Then you let God help. How does that thinking play into life? Now, remember, being a Christian doesn't mean you have to be a doormat or take advantage of either. Okay. But, but think, and then we're going to go over a little bit later uh, some brotherhood uh, for leadership battles. So, so that's kind of a basic definition of what we mean when we say a closer walk. A closer walk means that I've, I've, I have a desire to take Jesus from my head into my heart. So it becomes totally internalized in me. And once I've got that working, it's never going to be complete. But I've got that working on a closer walk. Then I think we're starting to get ready to give into it. I think we're starting to get ready to give And you can mentor without that, right? But if you have a deep in your soul... And then you're ready to, to mentor somebody. Now, we're going to talk about mentoring a little bit, but if you're an effective mentor, your role in that, in that relationship has to be like a rooting skill. Because people are different. So today, you got to talk to some person, here's my mentoring skills for you. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So you've got to be able to dance on your feet a little bit in the mentoring relationship. But thinking of others first is key. Now, we've been sitting in this room, I think, for about an hour. Does anyone need a biological break, a bathroom break, or water? Keep going. What are you going to do? Keep going. So I want to shift now huh, about how the brotherhood might help with this. And so first we're going to talk about stuff you probably already know. I won't take a long time through this. But sometimes we found in chapter meetings in processions like this, not everyone has a full understanding of the reach of the brothers. We know it a lot through communications, through we get stuff like that. We want to kind of step through this relatively quickly and, uh, and talk about it. Uh, it's the Episcopal Church's oldest and one that's most effective. So it's been around since 1883. Did you all know that? This is the 140th year in person. So let's think back 140 years. Number one, there's a lot, very few organizations we can talk about who started in 1983, other than the government, that are still trying. And remember, this organization we're part of has been through World War I, World War II, Great Depression, Vietnam, all that consternation, and it's still here. Why do you think it's still here? Why, why have we survived all those 140 years? Why? Because it's working, faith, and it's working. And, and there's, that's exactly right, Richard. There's one, one other thing underneath that book. Why do you think it's faith and it's still working? It's centered on God. It's centered on God. I think that's exactly right. It's centered on God. And you know, the organization kind of goes like this, right? And sometimes we feel, oh, we don't have enough young men. Hey, we got to see them. And that's just part of this journey that we're on together. Right? As long as we keep going at it, you know, we'll be there. I've been in it for 40 years. I remember when I joined the chapter I was in, I was 36 years old, and they gave me handstands because I raised. I raised, I raised the average age. Yes, sir. Are there any records, like pictures or anything that depicts what the brother looked like back then? Ah, can I pitch in on that one? Well, he's got some in his office. They had a thousand member Did meeting. Did you bring any? Huh? Did you bring any? <laughs> well, I don't know if we brought any, but we can send it to We've you. We've got a, uh, oh, okay. every now and then, somebody will be in Mama or Papa's attic mm -hmm. when he passes away, and they'll send something down. 
And one of those, Brother Cecil, is uh, from Province 2, a Brotherhood breakfast at Columbia University from 1932 to 33. That was an integrated group in 1932 there. And it's a black and white photo. You know how you do the panoramic photos? You see a lot of those. That's just one of them that's in the office. Uh, and there was a kid sitting up in front of it. And of course, they were all suited and tied. And this little boy, he was a teenager, was picking his nose for the camera. And I'm sure he became a leader in the community later on down the road. But he was a bit of a hooligan. But we've got those. Um, and we haven't taken them to put on a... Can you post? Well, I was just thinking, we'd have to pull them out of the uh, glass and do that. That's a good idea. We yeah, can do that. You, we've got a treasure trove of that in Louisville and also down in our kind of office. Cecil says, can we post those answers? Cecil's question yes. It's a very good question. I have another one, but not now. Yeah. Uh, Cecil, you can find everything to hear with us today. Thank you. Yeah, you've got it. We're talking about uh, what the President of St. Andrew is. So far, we've talked about how to take a closer walk with people. First, I want to get you up to speed. The author of what is the Brothers in Andrew? So it's been around since 1883. And how it started, homeless men were sitting on the streets out of St. Peter's of Chicago. And these guys reached out and looked for help. And so they, they named that the Brothers in Andrew. Then they said, instead of just physical nourishment, maybe we could provide some spiritual nourishment as well. And that started from prayer and study. So it started out just service, giving these people food. Then they went to that deeper thing. And, and I think that's our that's our mantra today. Prayer, study, and service in that order is very, very important. Um, it's a worldwide ministry, uh, 3,000 members, 350 chapters and parishes. And I think there's 40,000 people around the world that are in the same ministry. So it's still a pretty powerful member. It's survived World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, Vic. All these things in the world, God has kept this thing moving. And we're probably at a point like here's its peak, here's kind of one of the troughs, here, it's gonna, it'll happen like that forever. It's just how organizations do it. Ah, uh, uh, as our uh, Bishop of the United States. We have this statement Don't more weary, Brotherhood of St. Andrew. Michael Curry told the 158 brothers and guests he was at our meeting, Your core mission is the same as the core mission of the church. So he's been to a couple of our meetings to talk to us. And we are very pleased with that. And I think he's rolling off uh, this coming year, I think. Yeah, June, we'll like the new presiding bishop right down the street from the office at the convention center. And one of the candidates to replace him is uh, Reverend Rob Wright from the Diocese of Lynn. I'm a consultant for the Diocese of Lynn. Rob Wright is a member of the Brother of St. Andrew chapter in Mary Georgia. He's big in the Brotherhood, and we would have nothing more than him to become a bishop. We would feet down that door when he rises. He, uh, when he has his when he has his rector meetings for the diocese of Atlanta, and he goes like this. First, we always speak at the diocese convention. He gives us a half hour slot at the diocese convention. But he says this to his rector. He, he has one of us come up and talk about it. Then, I'm not saying you have to have a brotherhood chapter at your church, but I would like to know why you don't have it. Oh, okay. <laughs> he gently encourages it because he believes in it, right? And sometimes bishops and rectors do, sometimes they don't. And you can't, you can't force that issue, right? The biggest thing, the biggest thing in that space, and the biggest thing in mentoring space, is for each of you to be able to tell somebody else, you know, why do I believe in this? What's the value that's brought to my life? And when you can start speaking in those terms to somebody else, and, and then underneath that is what we talked about earlier, why Jesus in my life? Why do I believe in Jesus? If you can couple it, here's why I believe the brother say that. And, and the answer can't be, oh, the food is good, and we tell a lot of football story. That's all good. But, but being able to describe, that might be God calling. If it is, let's, let's uh, put it on the speaker. <laughs> <laughs> He's definitely got jokes on Here's some key <laughs> items about us. Uh, there's, a, there's our brother, Tom Welch, executive director, and, and their headquarters in Louisville, Kentucky. We have a strategic plan that we meet every three to five years, and we try to plan out things for the next three to five years. I don't know if you've ever had strategic planning in a work environment, or maybe at this church or in this diocese, but we focus hard on what we really want to do over time. What funding do we need to do the things we do? Okay. There's some, here's some other elements. Uh, we have executive board live conference calls. Cecil's our treasurer is part of that. We do a lot of discipleship training. 
uh, have a lot of social media work we do. Uh, we connect with the larger church through Evangelism Matters. I'm part of the racial reconciliation team. We do sessions called Sacred Ground around the country to get everyone in that space. Um, we try to connect with the Lutheran men, uh, denominational men's ministries. You see that thing in there, Lead Like Jesus? Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. So let me talk about that for a second. So there's a fellow, his name is Ken Blanchard. In the 80s, he had a business book called The Ten Minute Manager. You ever hear of that book? Ten Minute Manager. And he listed some things you can do to be a better manager. Okay? But he turned his life over to Jesus Christ in the late 80s. And he's developed this process called Lead Like Jesus. And it's not just for leaders. It, it talks about how each person can lead their life like Jesus led his life. And I was one of the seven people certified in the United States to lead that. And you might have seen we're offering it uh, November 14, 15, and 16 for four hours a day. No cost to any brethren to sign up. And it talks about it talks about how to get my heart in line with Jesus in a real practical way. How do I get my heart in line with Jesus? How do I get my head in line with Jesus? And how do I get my habits, my words, and my thoughts? I mean, my words and my habits in line with Jesus Christ. Extremely effective. It's got a lot of biblical quotes, but his big deal is how to live Jesus every day. You know, we live Jesus in the pew on Sunday. You know, I think so. When you leave there, you know, our, our, our message of Christian discipleship, at the end of that prayer, closing prayer, every Episcopal church and I see, send me out into the world to do your work, whatever that means. So he works a lot in that space. Now, how, do you, how do you do that every day? And how do you get your heart, your head, your thinking, and your words and actions to you? He's got some real practicality there. It's not just a bunch of, uh, well, if you believe stronger, I know this will happen. <laughs> but he helps you get into that space. It's pretty good. I'd love to encourage you. It's free, it won't cost anything. It's four hours, 14, 15, 16, November. It's called Day Like Jesus. Free is the start. first 20 in Red Pardon? Free is the first 20 Yeah, first 20 in Red We plan on taking that everywhere in the Brotherhood next year, uh, having quarterly sessions. It's very strong. It aligns with the Brotherhood well. And I think you'd find it very useful. I'm not trying to market it. I don't get paid. You know, for doing it. It's free. And, and four hours a day? Four, four hours a day. Four hours a day. Hours a day. Hours a day. Hours. And it's and, okay to mark, but. Pardon? I said it's okay to mark it. I think well, you're know, marketing for any personal need. <laughs> right. I'm marketing for Jesus because I have a really strong okay. It's probably one of the best individual spiritual development tools. You know, away from church, to, you know, which is a great individual spiritual development tool. But uh, away from that. How do you live stuff every day? You know, how do you really get out there and, and make it? So people will know you're Jesus without having a tattoo on your forehead. How, how does that work? Um, here's some other things, scouting we're big into, racial reconciliation, the workshop we do. Um, how, are, are you familiar with the term veteran-friendly congregation? Have you heard that term? Yes. Well, the Episcopal Church of the United States, you can become a veteran-friendly congregation. And what that means is there are certain things in your church you can do to welcome veterans. It's not a huge thing to do, but you become known as a veteran friendly congregation, like you might have a... a so this veterans friendly congregation, you can, you can make your congregation veteran friendly. It's simply what that means. You might host a meal for them once a month. A lot of brother chapters do that. And, and you make it known through the veterans that might be surrounding your church or in your church. And sometimes you might have a speaker. There's several speakers around the night that will come in and talk about the transition from being a veteran and back into normal life. Or just show an appreciation for veterans in your service. So if you want to be, don't have to be, doesn't cost anything. It's just a couple simple things you do. I will say this, in the chapters around Atlanta, it has increased our membership. Because the veterans you know, still believe in Jesus, some, but they may not know who that's really helping them. So when you have a special meal for veterans, and you get these guys around the World War II, Vietnam War, whatever it is, Desert Storm, they like being amongst their brothers that have had a similar experience. That's a good thing to do. Um, cause guys for vets, we're, we are into this group that trains dogs and be assigned to vets. Um, we do a lot of stuff around the country in restorative justice, prison ministry, evangelism I talked about, mentoring we're going to talk about today. You know what the largest brotherhood chapter is? Where would you think the largest brotherhood chapter in the United States is? Texas. It's close. Texas prison. Texas prison. He knows the answer. Texas prison. There's like 300 brothers. Remember, these two guys have been rock bottom. Rock bottoms. Have any of you ever done, that's called Kairos ministry, when you go into it. Anybody ever done Kairos ministry? You might try that once. It's pretty, they lock that door behind you. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. And so you're in that space. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of vetting that goes on first, but it's, uh, it's kind of a. To me, that's where Jesus went. That's where Jesus went. So experiencing that yourself is a pretty cool. Thing. That's the overall vision and mission of the brother. We're not going to read that, but I wanted you to know there is something, uh, something there, uh, that really guides us. If you had to summarize what we are, we're called to disciple others. Now we've talked about it already. So how did I define disciple or discipleship? What did I say that was? And silence is okay for a short time. If you don't answer, no one should know. What did I say discipleship or disciple was? I'm going to drop this down. Creating an environment for others to know and engage with Jesus. That's what a disciple does. And that takes on several avenues, right? Priests do that for us every Sunday with a sermon and a homily. And they're creating an environment. And, and that's our goal, too. And we're not going to preach to people, but somehow in our interactions through mentoring and others, trying to create an environment in which they will know and want to engage with Jesus Christ. And the biggest thing in that space is for you to be able to talk about the value of Jesus in your life. You know, I could come up to uh, uh, Wentworth and say, you know, you ought to, you ought to give to Jesus. I, I know it's going to be good for you. Uh, you ought to go. It's going to be much more powerful, I can say, if you have a minute. And okay, maybe I can talk to you about Jesus in my life and what it's meant to me. And that has a tendency to... Uh, Maybe not change a person's mind, but it's a different thing than, than talking about them, just kind of sharing your own thoughts about it, right? We're going to talk about that more coming up, but um, that's what we mean about discipling others, living with Christ at your center, being passionate about your faith, and being equipped to be a servant leader and lead like Jesus. So in summary, the prayer study and service, regular chapter meetings, how often do, you, do your chapters meet? Monthly, twice a month? Monthly. Okay. What do the chapter meetings look like? How does the agenda look like? Silence is okay for a short time. Prayer. prayer. Start off with prayer. Prayer. Okay. Use the liturgy and the devotional handbook? Yeah. Then what happens? Pardon? We have a um, short Bible study. Yeah. I think any longer than that, people might get boat seat itch. <laughs> but I think in that Bible study, what do I want you to do once you do a Bible study? What did I say earlier? What do I want you to do once you do a Bible study at the end? Once you talk about how you're going to live that out. But I think it's good to know it, right? It's good to understand what Matthew's telling us. But what does that what does that mean to you? And how do you take that away? Okay? That's by every Bible study you do. And if you facilitate one, uh, Try to make that happen. You know, oftentimes people think men's ministries are the best pancake clippers, Friday fish fryers, and barbecuers uh, on the planet. And here's what we're really about, is bringing men and youth to Christ so they are prepared and engaged to live in closer walk with Jesus. That's my feeling on what is the brotherhood, okay?
we can read the Bible, become aware and understand it, but if we don't do anything about living it, it's not going to be real for us. It's, still, it's okay to read it. I'm not, that's, it's good to read it. But I think Jesus wants us to live it. And I think, as I said before, our prayer of Christian discipleship as we lead the churches every Sunday sends us out to live what we heard. Okay? So, let's chat through this. And here's some kind of features and benefits. And this wouldn't be something you talk to a mentor, but it might be something you have. We have a little booklet coming up that's going to describe this a little bit. We have, a, we have a brochure on the website that talks about this. But it doesn't give you this stuff. So here's some features and benefits. We won't go through every one. Uh, but the St. Andrew's Cross has been going since 1886. Only church publication about four weeks of ministry. Uh, we have several other things we're involved with. Uh, we do webinars, podcasts, a podcast, Zoom conference calling. Um, remember the National Coalition of Ministry for Men and Network with them. The Union of Black Episcopalians were engaged with them. Gold yeah. level life member. Pardon? Gold level life member. Say that one more time. Thank We're you. a gold level life member. What is that? Uh, that means your membership is a life membership with a comma in the front of the check. Okay. Very happy. <laughs> <laughs> Veteran friendly congregation we talked about. I, I will say one thing. To get, that's going to get older men into the brotherhood, right? That's not a bad thing. And they might have younger uh, you know, children. That's not a bad thing to think you're going to cost you anything to be a veteran. For members of the Military Chaplains Association, um, we network with other denominational men's ministries, the forward movement. You, are, you get that little forward day by day booklet. Mm-hmm. That guy has been to several of our meetings to talk about. The St. Francis Foundation helps us with discipleship training. It's on our website. And the several communication materials. Uh, we have officer and leadership training. This is in that space, what we're doing today. And we have a, a bishop advisory council of 35 bishops to help us with advice. Um, regional workshops. That's kind of what this is. Pre-COVID and pre-pandemic, we did this over a day and a half. And we bring in some featured speakers and stuff like that. And if that makes sense up here, we're glad to do that, right? No cost to you. But you have speakers come in and speak about certain aspects that you would want to hear about. You know, we would survey you and say, well, what would make sense for this body of men in this area to hear about? You know, you know someone would come in and talk about it. Usually a day and a half, and they're a very good, widely attended group. Uh, so a chapter, let's talk about the chapter value. It does the early <coughs> disciples that, excuse me, who's talking? I'll get so, so chapter, uh, what I like about the chapter, the chapter model has to do with a shared event. Like we all attend a shared event. Like this is a shared event. But we'll have some common feelings about this event. A whitewater raft trip with you. That's a shared event. But the chapter model is meant to be a shared event. Like the early days of Christianity, but people get together every, every periodically. They sing a song on an old instrument, and that was their starting so that's what this is meant to be, the value. The, the environment in these, in these chapter readings, and brother, really, is that the Bible is God's truth in all areas of life. Someone told me this, and I like it. It's his passport to heaven. Passport to heaven. The Bible is his passport to heaven. I like that. Um, and Jesus Christ, our Lord, and leads us daily. The second part of that, sometimes I forget. You know, instead of, or it says, leave us daily. Tom wants to take control of the but I'll leave Instead of asking God to leave me. Okay. Asking God to leave me. I might have told you some of this, but each morning when I remember, oh, speaking of remembering, I'm 76 years old, maybe you've heard this, but when you turn 75, two things start to happen. Mm-hmm. One is you start to forget them. Yeah. And the second thing is, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
and I'm horrible. Horrible.
about what makes us different. If someone were asking, why do I want to join the Brotherhood of Saint Andrew? Having your own statement about that. You know, what has it done for me? We just did a session in um, Cummings, uh, Cummings, Athens, Georgia, at Emmanuel Episcopal Church. And we did this, and we had a member stand up. And first, their chapter is kind of fun. We have four guys there. And so then we started in February worrying about how can we get how can we get more men engaged? And we've done this several times. So we advertised a session for all men of the parish. And we planned it in March, and we have to do it in October. All men of the parish are invited to this session to just learn about what the Brotherhood of St. Andrew is. It's not an insurance sale, we're not twisting your arm, we're just trying to tell you what it is. Okay? And we had one of the brothers there stand up and tell what it's meant to his life. And we did some of this kind of stuff too. And we had we had over 35 attendees, and we had 12 sign up to be members. Now we're not seeing all the way 12. We're seeing there's people that want to know about more about Jesus Christ. And we've done that several times, having a, a, a morning breakfast on Saturday, inviting all men in the parish, as long as the rector's involved. And it's gone a long way towards getting more people engaged beyond our usual suspects. In my parish, we've got 22 guys who are the usual suspects for the last 15. And we've gone to, we have, a, you have a picture book in your con congregation, pictures of members of your congregation. You have one of those? Yeah. We went through that picture book and we said, well, well we don't know Todd. And Todd's kids are now in college. Maybe instead of being home on Saturday morning, we should ask Todd. So we take, we had about 30 of those guys, and they're now starting to come. We took them out to breakfast and talked about what the brotherhood is, and we love to see them. Not that you should or should. Because we feel that if someone's not there on a Saturday, a young man, and your meetings are on a Saturday, and they're out there with their kids coaching football or doing something. That's probably where God wants them. That is probably where God wants them. But we don't forget them. So we started doing it for young people. We started having a brotherly meeting on a Tuesday night, you know, after dinner and after the kids were in bed. And that seemed to work pretty good, right? We tried to meet them uh, where they are and trying to get more inclusive. If we go back to this model, you can see on the left the steps to internalize a life of Christ the center are those and the brotherhood takes it all the way down where sometimes service only stops at the top two. Huh? They don't get into the deepness of the one So if I was going to trip myself to get in the I'd want to go back to the, the, the 12 commandments that Tom said. Then I want to identify the low water line. What are the, what are, what are the virtues that mentor has to have. So I'm going to list four or five of them below the water line that I think I want you to have if you're going to be effective. You believe in caring about people. That's just a belief. Not so much what you do, but you think caring about your fellow man is good. That's a lot. That's a virtue. And that's got to be way down deep. I don't know. A good Samaritan story. You care about people. One of the issues you have yeah. about that same yeah. issue, caring about people, a chapter may have about 30 members but only 15 members have paid up. The other 15 members exist. They don't come to meetings. They're probably on an inactive list. Would you recommend the treasurer of that chapter pay for those 15 members? Well, that's a good question and a great question, one that applies to a lot of chapters. I mean, it's chapter by chapter. Like you said, we are more localized than we are national. Yeah. That's what's happening. The environment is that a lot of chapters have become so localized. They center all the decisions within the chapter rather than referring to a policy or something that National could probably put out there yeah. that says, well, you know, we, you know, you know, something where a give and take can occur. Let me respond to several questions in there. And they're all great questions. So the first, brothers aren't paying. What we try to do is one or two of us call up Fred, take him to lunch, and say, now, we're not trying to twist your arm and say, you've got to pay. But tell us what's going on. How can we be of more value? Just, just, you know, now watch now. Our beliefs, what we think, what we say and do. Yeah. So if Fred's thinking he's not going to pay dues, let's go ahead. he can't afford it. Pardon? Okay, he says that, then we'll pay it for it. Yeah, that's the okay. Point. If, if that's the issue, and I'm being judgmental here, please don't. But if, if Fred really can't afford it, but he still believes, we'll pay that for him. 
We will pay that fine in my own check. But if somebody else says, well, that's no, just not speaking to me anymore. Well, you want to unpack that a little bit and say, remember, believes me the thought, why is, what, what, what could we do to make this people? How could that be better? You want to, that's an opportunity, so that's what I see, to get us, you want to find those answers for the people. And, and that's a one-on-one, -on -one. it's not a Zoom call, it's not a phone call, it's let's go over breakfast and, and just chat. And, and uh, then what, creating that environment like that is, um, is a caring thing to do. Like I care enough, so, so that's, does that get some of your question? That's the environment I'm talking about. That's the part, yeah, yeah, that's right. So what, what, yes, go ahead. The food structure is not financial enough to pay for the other members who not get the Well, over time, the so chapter is not financially able to pay for, to the, pay for another person. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to tell you something in that space, and if you repeat this, There'll be more than physical distance in our relationship. <laughs> and they won't be able to identify the dental records. <laughs> I think the reason of his question is can national accommodate a specific group who cannot or unable to afford to pay the dues? Think but, so. but accommodate them as many. Yeah. It, it, let, let us back up for a second. But you were saying that the F the members want the 50 members not pay as the chapter should be paying for as the 50 members. I think they should be, but can they? Can they? Let's just take one at a time here. Yeah. I want to make sure your question is. I was hearing your question like just one person couldn't pay the dues. And the, and the chapter didn't have enough money to pay that person's dues. That's what I thought you were starting with. Yeah. Yeah. So his question was this member can't pay and we don't have enough money. So if that happens, I'll pay for it myself and just call them. I've done that before. I'm not going to pay for a whole chapter, but if you find someone who can't do it, but they believe in the brotherhood, I'll pay for that person's dues. Tom Martin. I won't give you my bank account number, but I will do that. But what that can do is it tells people that we care about you. And, and sometimes, you know, so does that answer that one question? Yeah. Okay. And then, and then we want to encourage that person to stay with us. Their economics will change. But really what we want to happen, so, so what I would be doing, watch that, watch that. I would be helping this person out, and he's got to pass hey, it on somewhere. Hey, 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 so that's the answer for that person. And I've done that before, and we'll continue to do that. But, but we want to go to a national Yeah, level. okay, now we're going to go to the next question. Let's go no. answer, answer your question. Can can he's going to, he's going to speak to us. I was stepping in so I can hear the question. Whoa, 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 whoa. I was stepping in so I can hear the question. Whoa, 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 whoa. Ask your question again so we can all hear it. Okay. Now, the national does not have a policy. As far as I know, maybe you can help me out. Where they can accommodate unpaid members whether they're financially, there's a financial hardship, yeah. which means that the Brotherhood does not have an accommodation for hardship. Okay. How can we, as a, as a national group, create a hardship program to maintain membership, Great question. even though they cannot afford to pay, or, and, and somewhere in that policy, develop an annual review of that individual? Or those individuals. That's a great okay. topic for another now, time and space. Now <coughs> the answer. Yeah. Now that great discussion for another time and space. We have, uh, as you all may know, I'm not in the office every day right now. Uh, in there, well, I'll be in there most of December, part of January. But we get these type phone calls, Brother Cecil, every now and then, and there's usually a way where it comes. It, it gets taken well, care of, but there is no policy established, and I think that's something a strategic planning committee could address next time they get when they get together. Well, not just the, the strategic planning, but the membership committee on the day who yes. should be able to develop a policy so that we don't lose them. That's we, we, uh, that's and we do, and I think as the board changes in the first couple of days of February, I got I got to be. Uh, I gotta be a cheerleader for a second. We've got a national conference just down the road, in-person conference in Baltimore, one, two, three, February. Hope you all can make that. We've got some phenomenal speakers. But one of the things we're gonna wind up dealing with with our next board, Brother Cecil, is this very issue, and it will come through. We've got a very active membership committee 
Uh, I was at their Zoom meeting on Thursday night, and if any of y'all would like to be a part of that committee, it's just a matter of being a phone call away to make it happen. Brother Nick? Yeah. Uh, first of all, the word accommodate, what does it mean? What? Accommodate. What, what does it mean in this context? Oh, well, let me say, in, in other words. Let me say something like Fair Law. I've been read for 40 years. Years ago, we had a pocket of money. Right. And someone, for the right reasons, they would submit a proposal for a scholarship a donation to the Brotherhood. And it had to be, we can't make it, we've had to be, it had to be some reason, right? But and then we would fund that. And that, through COVID and all that, that kind of, and, and Tom right, we're thinking about having this reserve fund. Uh, I know, and I'm, my, uh, please, your feet, this, my chapter, we collect $5 every time we eat. And so we've got $9,500. And we do that for other chapters around Atlanta and members who can. So we're trying to get that on a national level so that if someone wants to be a member, but for whatever reason, and, and the reason is vetted, it's not just uh, I'm playing golf with my money instead of putting it in, then I'd be a dozen. But your point is excellent, and we need to do that to encourage people to stay close to each other. I think it's an excellent question. Excuse me, Nick. But that's, that's what I was trying to talk to. Right. And Tom, thanks for your... Uh, Talk, look. Thanks for your comments. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I just wanted to understand what the comment because I feel as a as a as an organization, what we said we are, regardless of whether someone could afford membership dues or not, they should be allowed to be a member. Sure. It's not an organization of exclusion, yeah. exclusion no. but inclusion. Yeah. And it's from the chapter level. We have to figure out whether or not that person could pay dues. There should be personal interaction. If the person can't, the chapter should try to yeah. accommodate that. If the chapter can't, you could um, pass yeah. the information and say, we want this person on our roster, but we can't afford to pay for that person. But that person is an integral part of, the mem of our membership. So that's something that we have to work on. And um, that person will still be getting whatever services the Brotherhood, in general, can give. They're still a member of the organization, but they just, for whatever the reason is, they can't afford to pay yeah. membership dues. But I don't want money to be in the way of anyone coming to Jesus. Right. And I think at some point when they are able and capable, then they, they ought to start doing that. Right. And then they even ought to start... Let's say, let's say I haven't been able to because of financial hardship. Brothers should step in and, and allow, and, and based on, you talk about betting and conversation. Okay, we'll go ahead with Tom. Now, the minute Tom becomes financially able, Tom ought to make sure he's the one who's helping another man who can't do it, right? Mm -hmm. So we're carrying that. I think, I don't want the money. I don't want to deviate from the issue of the care and, yeah. and building that relationship with So that's a good comment about a mentor or someone that down here. This idea of caring about others, and we just talked about how that plays out. What's another thing down in here that that makes mentoring and relationships and all that effective? We're talking about below the bottom line. Caring is one. What else? Penny. Oh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. It's kind of surprising to me, but it's brilliant. No, I'm, just <laughs> I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. Faith. Think about that for a minute. No, faith in what? Let's play that out. Really? That's the right answer. Faith. Well, what does he mean by faith? Let's have some. That's great. So, what else? What to be an effective mentor? What, what does faith mean to you? What, do you? what faith do you have if you're going to be a mentor? Well, for me, sharing my faith and what got me to Jesus, mm -hmm. which you know, that's what I try to do because I think my experience and all the mistakes that I made, you know, growing up all of the reasons that I find that I could not have been saved without Jesus. Correct. This is just my personal story. That, to me, what it allows me to be an effective mentor because I think I talk to young people about that. You know, awesome. if, if Jesus could really? save me from all the stuff, yes. I say stuff, <laughs> well, there's hope for anybody. There's that's another place, so you, you've, talked about, you've talked about the faith in your life. Correct. You want to talk about it in a different way. Correct. That's brilliant. Correct. But I, when he said that, here's what struck me. That I've got the faith in God. If I work correctly in this situation. 
that God's going to reach that person. That's that's a different, and I'm not saying you're wrong, but there's a different level of faith, and that's what I got from him. If I believe deeply and my faith is strong, then when I go through this thing of talking to this person, I'm entering it, that I've got the faith that Jesus Christ is going to be in there with us. The right. Holy Spirit will be in that space. I believe strongly about right. this. God works in the space between two people most of the time. Right. And he works in our administrative areas too, but most of the time, Jesus is in that space. Mm-hmm. We're able to communicate with that person effectively, tell our own story, mm-hmm. but then know that if I, if I believe deeply, God's going to get in that space with me and right. And that's what I got from your faith. Mm-hmm. Is that, that I have that faith below that if I go do this, I need to tell my story, right. but I've got this faith that it's going to be a good Jesus right. Christ. What else is below the line? Caring and faith. What else is below the line? Belief. Belief. You've got to have belief. Perfect. Mm-hmm. you got to believe deeply in Jesus Christ. Yeah. So, let's say you're having a conversation with somebody. And, and um, we could probably role play this, but they told me it had to be done by 7 o'clock tonight. Are we doing okay? <laughs> but if, let's, let's play this. So, so, someone asks you, why do you believe in Jesus? Christ. Now, what are you going to say? You're not saying right now. But you probably say, it's like the start. We started, right? Mm-hmm. Well, the scripture tells me so. My parents tell me, you got to have a better answer than that. It, it gives me a sense of calm. Mm-hmm. It gives me a sense of peace. And I know when I'm not connected to Jesus, there's something in my life that just doesn't feel right. Yeah, of course. So you got to be able to tell that story. So belief is, so below the water line so far, we've got caring, we've got faith, and we've got belief. How about one or two more? What 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 what, what makes this symmetric business work? You've got caring, faith, and belief. What's maybe one or two more that should be below the water line that'll help us? Love. Or, yes, love. Love. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Sticks. Help me a little bit more. We say love. What do you mean when you say love? What does that mean? Share love. Yeah. Empathy. Empathy. Yeah. That's a good word too. Now I've done a lot of mentoring, and I've done a lot of training in mentoring sessions. If you train yourself just to get those five items of the party, and they're about that, that's your walking around talk. That's thinking on your feet talk. You're going to go strong into a mentoring session. Okay, you're going to go strong into there, right? Those, everybody's ever, is anyone ever perfect in this stuff? Well, probably not. It's, it's something that we all need to work on. And typically it takes some practice. So if we had more time today, we would set up, you're a mentor and you're the mentee, and you're going to mentor and someone would be observing. We don't, we're not doing that today. That's more of the day and a half model that we teach. Okay. But we'll always come back to that. The, the, the Ten Commandments come, but they're excellent. But they only become more effective if you're working on that below the waterline stuff. They only become more effective. And think about your daily interactions with family members and other people, right? They become effective when they're done through a set of love and care and yada, 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 yada like that, right? I think we were talking, uh, example, example. Um, have we talked the grocery store here this morning? Okay, here's, here's an example. Huh? I yeah. think we did with Tony. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you go go through the grocery store. Here's an example. Here's an example of below the waterline stuff. It's not always this magnanimous, let's have a metric session, we'll meet for coffee. And it's not often like that, right? It's often like this. So this lady, you can tell, you know, she's checking your groceries and she's going through that stuff and she looks tired and everything. Let's say her name is, is Carol. You see it underneath that, right? So if I'm really living out that stuff, Karen, gosh, I appreciate the way you're doing my groceries today. Just a fantastic job. I appreciate the diligence that you took in doing that. It's probably one of the best checkout things I've ever had. You see, you see what I just did? It, it, it just created a real caring environment for her. Now, I don't say, and if you want to know about Jesus, just come and talk to me. No, no. no. But I'm expressing that. See? So once the more you do of that, the more you do of that, more regular becomes. So let's talk about what are the six words? What are the six words? Let's say I believe in this stuff. 
to get better here. Now, what are the six words I should use with this to make this effective? What are the six words I use for that? Science of the paper for communication. Practice, 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 practice. Practice that stuff with another person. Practice it. How many people golf in here or think they golf or like to golf? Play tennis. How about tennis? Okay, let, let, let's, let's take either a tennis player or a professional golfer. Professional golfer, right, they're not playing a tournament, they're hitting a thousand balls a day with someone watching. Professional tennis player, they're practicing that serve a thousand times a day and someone's coaching them and watching. So they get to the tournament, they're ready, right? So our tournament, our tournament is everyday life that we see people. That's our tournament. So when I, if, you, if you believe in Jesus Christ, I think he's asking us to practice. That whole 12 disciples thing is about getting them ready to practice to play the game, right? That's what that was about. We're going to talk about uh, parables. We're going to let you see situations. You're going to come and watch me. And so this idea of, of getting that below the waterline stuff nailed, I cannot talk to you more about it. If you're going to be an effective mentor, working on this, and there's, there's, there's some textbooks and stuff you can read. But just start having conversations and practicing expressing caring and beliefs. First, how are you today, uh, Cecil? Hope it's going well. How are you today, Cecil? What's going on in that national organization we have to be able to help with in the finances? How, how does that work? Trying to be more caring about the other person. You see, everyone see what I'm talking about? Okay. I like what this Reverend Melissa Skelton out in, in Tom Welch gave us as a, a bishop provisional out in Washington. I really like that statement. The Bread State is a men's ministry of substance centered on prayer more than anything else. Centered on prayer. Then prayer, and then we study, and then we serve. I really like it. When, 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 when someone in the clergy can come at it with that picture without being told, pretty powerful statement. You know, we like every right here to say that. I want to go through, I don't know if you know, do you know of the the eight core values of the brotherhood. Anybody know this? Heard this on our website? This is the stuff that sits, sits down here. For the brotherhood. Here's some of the brotherhood prayer study and service. This eight things we're going to go through. That's what this is. So I'd like somebody to read the first one, both the bold and the unbolded part. Someone go ahead and read that for us. He's excited about Jesus and the world he's going to Demonstrates a passion for Jesus, exercises leadership, is a positive and purpose. Thank you very much, Michael. What's the most important word in those that first group of work thing? What do you think the most important word is? Passion for Jesus. Pardon? Passion for Jesus. Passion for Jesus. What's in front of passion for Jesus? Yes, yes, well, I can say I've got to watch this. What's this? I've got a deep passion. I've got a passion for Jesus. It's the center of my life. I'm not saying you've got to be like that, but demonstrates is key. If you keep that inside, it's not going to be good. So demonstrates pretty key. Now, now you got to be yourself. You know, if someone sees you talking not like yourself, and, man, you have too much, something's going on today. What is it? <laughs> the second one, someone read the, the second one for us. It's a good character. Demonstrates commitment to a Christian way of life. Humility. Caring, What's the most important word in that one? Demonstrates. Again, right? So what do you have to do to demonstrate something? Back to our earlier models. What do you have to do to demonstrate something? You gotta believe in it, and you gotta think about it, and then you'll demonstrate it. Right? You gotta believe in it, you gotta think about it, and then you're gonna demonstrate it. It's that simple. Uh, someone read the next one. Demonstrates vision. Fully understands and attitudes. But looks at next hand of commission and anticipates challenges and creates a clear path towards achievement. Their thinking and actions are in unison with the okay, this is, same plan. This is, that's a good, this is a little trickier. What's the most important word or words up here? I think it's understand. What do you have to do before you can okay, let's, let's, let's play a just on. What do you have to do before you can advocate for something? Understand. Clearly understand, right? You've got to clearly understand and then advocate. So that's right. That's right. It's clearly understanding. For me to get clear understanding of something, I usually have to ask my wife and just say, well, Tom, you've got an understanding of that. 
but you don't have a clear understanding. Let me tell you. <laughs> so clear, clear understanding. Okay, that, that's the first three. And remember, these are below the waterline kind of stuff. Um, us, someone read the next one. Knows the Bible, is willing to share its teachings with others. Honors and reveres the Bible as a standard of life. Is willing to share it with others and needs to embrace biblical principles, but does not need to be a biblical scholar. Praise the Lord. Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> you think it's one of the most important words up there? I like honors too. If I honor something, a lot of good stuff happens. If I honor my family, if I honor Jesus, if I honor my, a lot of good stuff happens. If that's a basic belief of mine that I'm going to honor Jesus Christ, all my thinking goes down the right channel. Now. Biblical scholar. Let's revisit our friends John and Fred. You remember John and Fred, the baseball guys? You remember them? Yeah. <laughs> John comes up to Fred. He says, hey, Fred, lifelong Episcopal. Mm -hmm. Lifelong Episcopal. John says, hey, Fred, I'll bet you $100. I can say the 23rd Psalm from memory. 100 bucks. Fred says, John, don't know the Bible that well. You barely know the Lord's Prayer. He says, I'll bet you, Fred, now. I'll be on that stuff now. And Fred says, well, before I put down my money, John, let me hear a little bit of it. John says, okay, 23rd Psalm. Now I lay me down to sleep. <laughs> Fred says, wait, 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 here's your hundred bucks. I didn't know you knew it that well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not a, I'm not a biblical scholar. I, I am very impressed by the people that will say they can quote something, or we're doing a Bible study, and the person says that also relates to Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. I like that stuff. But I'm forever asking them, okay, how should I take that and impact my life this day? Just this one day. Yes, Seth. Let me just draw a scenario. Here. Sure. Now let's say I get together, going external, not internal, and I'm having a conversation with a group of guys. Yeah. And I'm discussing Jesus. And then one of them says, well, you're not a priest. Why are you discussing Jesus? How do I answer something? Well, I, I like to discuss stuff that I believe in. And that's a belief I have. You could ask me about a hobby I have, but I, but I believe in Jesus. And I like to discuss things I believe in. That's that's why that's who I am. And I believe strongly in Jesus Christ. Person. Yeah, it's my, where, my story. Where is it written that you, you could only discuss it if you're a priest? Yeah, or just, if you're <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't see. Now, let's, I would let's, answer them that way. Wait, let's, let's just play this out. Yeah. Yeah. Next comment is right. But what does Nick's, Nick say? Where is it written? Only, where, what is Nick's comment, at least of this? It gets into a little bit of this, right? This is a good comment. It's a good, but you don't want to do that. You want to say, well, there, own your own feelings. It's something I believe deeply in, and it's very powerful to me. Because then you want the next question. Well, why is it powerful to you? Well, then, then you start talking to them about the value of Jesus. Now. Then you're starting to create the environment within the knowing of Jesus. Now, Nick's right, though. Sometimes you say, where does it say only priests can talk about Jesus? Well, that gets into a whole other channel of conversation that we typically, no one wins. That's a no-win problem. Does that help? Well, yes, in a way, but I have to be prepared for that question. I have to be. And, and I can't just say, well, I have a certificate in, in no. you know, theology. No. Yeah. It's what we have to do. Wait, wait, wait. Let me say something. Sorry. We talked earlier today, but you have to be able to describe why do I believe in Jesus? You have to work on that answer. Exactly. And it's not because, yeah, I went to a Bible study school and I got this. Or, no, it's, it's about you. It's it. Go ahead. Well, 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 I was going to say it's just it's general conversation. If I, my belief system is of a certain yes. subject, yeah. then I believe in it. I don't have to, there's no way around it. I, mean, I, I think that's excellent. The next question may be though, and if you get this next question, you're 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 around the third base at home plate. Grand thing. Why do you believe that? If you get to that space, and it's not my parents told me to, and the Bible tells me, if you get that question crystallized, mm -hmm. that's the question that generally will get people to think. Um, okay. Eager to serve, active enough for ways to contribute to the mission of the brotherhood inside and outside in which they serve. What's the most important word? Actively. You're not sitting back and waiting for a brotherhood for, for Nick to tell you, go do it. You're actively looking for ways to serve, right? Takes responsibility, anticipates 
and it embraces challenges and facilitates the solution. Now, um, have the teachable spirit, like seeing others learn. That's the most important thing. You enjoy seeing others learn. You, the best teachers I've ever had, they weren't always quizzing me, but they were. They, were, they enjoyed seeing me learn something. And I've got to tell you, if you've ever had that experience, I'm sure we all have, someone coming to Jesus through what you've done or said, there's nothing about it. There's nothing better than that. But you believe in others. You desire to create an environment for others to know and engage with Jesus Christ. Been through this. The new website. Show your hands. So here's what I encourage every chapter to do. The first meeting in January, put this on your screen and climb through it. And get someone to point out to you what's there and all that stuff. And get to know it, right? Everything you ever wanted to know about the president is there. Both below the waterline and above. There's a whole training section with PowerPoints you can click on to kind of do what we're doing today at a chapter meeting if you want to. I would spend time in once a year going through this recently updated and very powerful. One of the best things on here is called the Chapter Development Guide. And it's got songs you might sing, how you might conduct the meeting. So please, please, if I could ask one thing of you. If it would be, be that today. Tom, where would they find that link on from the homepage? Brothersandrew.net. No, but I mean the communication that guy. Oh, you just oh, it's under the chapter development guide. Just go out here and you do this search. Got a little error right there. And you go to say up. chapter development guide. Or even better, you could go watch now, watch now. Brothersandrew.net chapter development guide. And I'll bring it right up. And then you can click on one of the 120 items that's on there. Bring it up and print it out. How to have a meeting. Suggested uh, events you might have. Like mentoring. There's a whole training site too. Okay. So are you saying that this PowerPoint that you're showing us is on this stuff? I can. No, I'll send it to you. Yeah, I can send this PowerPoint to you. Yeah, I'll. I'm gonna. I'm gonna put this out there because there's several of them out there. This will be out there. You have to go to the training, and you'll see discipleship, servant leadership, how to run a meeting. Um, the eight core values, you'll see everything we talked about. And these here. ten commandments that you point We out. haven't put those out yet, but we will. Well, those are in the mentor network. I can come back to that after lunch before yeah. we hand it off to Brother Nick. Okay. Let's uh, do a couple things here. So I think at the end, are we doing okay? Any questions about what I've covered so far? Okay. So I think if you think about it, I think it's true that men want something to give their lives to. They want someone to share their life with. And I'm not talking just about a spouse. I think men like to share their lives with other men in common years. And I think that's true. We wouldn't be here today. I mean, if I miss a brotherhood meeting in my chapter, I really feel like I've missed something. I've been very connected to it for 40 years. Men also want a system that helps a reasonable explanation of why the first two are hard, and the brotherhood will help solve that. Our primary focus is to create disciples so that the mission of the church can be carried out. The most successful on the tenets of prayer and study are eternalized. And living out the tenets helps one deepen and eternalize Jesus Christ. A couple key summaries. Our job is to deepen our sense of the presence of St. Andrews, that our thoughts, words, and actions are what Jesus thinks they do, so that our lives can be lived without intervention, and we and others can feel and share the peace passes all understand. Now before I close, I want to tell you a short story. Do you have time for a short story? Yes. yes. This will be yes, this will be no, and I promise this is the last question. There's this wise old sage, and this wise old sage lives on the outskirts of Long Island. This guy's brilliant. He comes to town periodically, and he sits in the middle of the town square, much like I'm sitting now, and he lets anyone who has a question ask him this Anyone who has a question can ask him any question. And he's always able to answer them. For years he's been able to answer them. And this kind of frustrates the town people that they can't stump the sage. So these two guys, uh, I think I got an idea we could stump the sage. And um, what I'll do is I will capture the small little bird. And I'll put this live bird behind my back. And I'll walk up to the sage and I'll say, wise old sage, I've got this bird behind my back. Is this bird alive or is it dead? If the sage says the bird is dead, I'll show him the bird. And if the 
say he says the bird is alive, I squish its neck behind my back. Ooh. And I'll show him a dead bird. Huh? <laughs> we got it. He can't answer this. Remember, I've got a live bird behind my back. Why is old saying, is that bird alive or dead? He says, it's dead. I'll show him a live bird. Why is old saying, is that bird alive or dead? It's alive. Squish its neck, show him a dead bird. There's nothing. He can do about the Spirit of God. So it goes through the whole town. The wise old saints come and we've got this, we've got this question that we're going to stump. But he will not get it right. It'll be the first time in history. Put all the town people are just crowded around. Wise old sage comes to town. He's answering all these questions. Finally, this guy comes up to the wise old sage. He says, Wise old sage, I've got this bird behind my back. This is a bird alive. Silence over the town, just like they would like now. Why is old Sage Rogers here? Yeah. So he comes up and he says, The choice is in your hands. <laughs> <laughs> so, so listen, listen now, before we leave that thought, listen. First, I appreciate you all for being here. This is very inspiring for me to be with the police. But the choice of what we do with Jesus is in our hands. How we go forward from what we hear. This, in other words, whatever we do, the choice is in our hands. And I think each day Jesus wants us to take a choice to move from awareness, understanding, down to internalization with Jesus Christ in the Son. And then I think our life gets a lot better. I think I've got a quick closing prayer. Um, oh, ask yourself, there's some questions you might ask yourself. And I'll send you this PowerPoint. But to measure yourself, are you living out? What does good look like when the brother is lived? And how does one live out the values? So let's say this, this uh, closing prayer together. If you let's say this with me, please. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day and our time together. Help us to continue to understand you.
And now we'll go into a closing prayer. And we have a volunteer. Brother, thanks. Mm -hmm.